centered, yay. Hi guys, sorry, there's a little delay. Um, first, I just wanna say hi. I hope you guys are all having a good time, I am. Um, I'm gonna take things in a different direction now and I just wanna give a disclaimer that I'm probably gonna cry. I'm a crier, don't worry, do not be alarmed. I'm fine, you can cry with me, we can cry together, it's all good, don't worry. And with that, I will begin. <laughs> all right, so I wanna start with a question. Have you guys at any, can you guys hear me? I feel like I'm such a loud person and I'm not coming off loud right now. Am I okay? Okay, more, less, more? we're good? Okay, Whoa, let's go. <laughs> all right, question for all of you. Um, at any point in your life, whether you were a status, whether you are an anarchist, whenever it happened, have you ever just felt not okay? Like depressed, sad, angry, lonely, inadequate, unworthy, any of them, raise your hand. Yeah, me too, cool. <laughs> All right, well, we are not alone. Whether you are a hardcore status, whether you're an anarchist, depression is on the rise, anxiety is on the rise, people are suffering. Oh, my startup disk is full. <laughs> oh no, and I can't X out of it. <laughs> Hold on one second. <laughs> Wait, there we go, okay, cool. Yeah, my computer is suffering, everybody's suffering. Um, <laughs> I gotta clear it off, okay. Um, I do wanna add the caveat that I do think rates are increasing potentially and partially just because people are more willing to talk about it now. There's less of a stigma, so there's more people opening up about it that may be affecting the rates, but nonetheless, people are having a hard time. There are a lot of people who feel caught and feel trapped. Now I have a second question. So for those of you who are anarchists, in the time since you have been anarchists, have any of you felt depressed, anxious, angry, any of the above, because you're just trying to be free and you are, cons yes, exactly, you are completely blocked or frustrated by a state of society. I'll raise my hand again. Yeah, I think this is a common feeling among many of us. Thank you. <laughs> um, I love this meme, but I have found, so I've been in this community since 2011. I started making videos a while ago, and I've been to a lot of these events, I've talked to a lot of people online, and I found a common sentiment. It's not necessarily the rule, but it is common, is a lot of people love to blame the government for all their problems. And there's this mentality of, if only I or humanity could escape the matrix, then I would finally be happy. If only something were different, if only there were some different external factor, then I wouldn't be so unhappy on the inside. Well, there's also the additional layer that many of us really like to mock status for you know, being status and being emotional and stuck in their miserable world of subservience and ignorance, and I am so guilty of this, especially if you look at my older videos. Like, that's all I ever did was mock people. Um, I use this meme just because all I did was Google sheeple. It's kind of a derogatory term, and one came up. I see sheeple who don't even know they're supporting mass murder and corporate greed. Oh my gosh, okay, yeah, true, okay. So in our often common internal narrative, we have this sense of here are these other people, these status, and they're slave to emotions and propaganda, but we're evolved, we're anarchists, we've seen the truth, we've transcended, we're free, right? Um, well, bear with me here, but I am about to argue that this elevated sense of freedom from statism as being truly free is as delusional as status thinking they can tax their way to prosperity. But before I get into that, I don't want to trigger anybody. This isn't to say that our philosophy is wrong. Obviously, I believe in the philosophy of freedom. Uh, and I would pretty confidently argue that we tend to be more open-minded than your average statist. And I also don't want to act like our feelings of frustration and sadness and feeling alone in response to statism are invalid. They're so valid. I feel them all the time. I'm sure a lot of us do. So I'm not here to disregard these things and act like we shouldn't be feeling this way. How we feel is probably like a completely normal and appropriate response to all the injustice and violence we see in the world. So this is all legitimate. However, while the weight of this adds stress and hopelessness and anxiety and anger, just like all the other humans who are not yet anarchists, we have trauma and programming that is at the very best peripherally related to statism. So an example of that would be if you were hit in your home growing up, that's a trauma in and of itself, and it may make people more willing to submit to violent authority in government, but the problem didn't start with the government, unless we're passing it down from generation. You know, it's interrelated, but there's still something very nuclear, it, nuclear family, I mean. <laughs> um, so the trauma is very personal, and the rage we feel toward the state is only the tip of the iceberg. But the government becomes a perfect target for us to project and lay blame and be angry, and then we don't have to address our true wounds. So when I talk about these things, I don't feel authentic unless I talk about my own struggles. Like I don't wanna stand up here and be talking about emotional well-being and having these reactive emotions and act like I don't. 
So I want to give you a personal experience, um, and this is where I'm probably going to cry. So um, I used to be editor-in-chief for the anti-media, and it was my dream job. Um, you can see our little anarchist symbol up there. Um, we covered all these topics that people like you love to hear about. We covered the police state, the war machine, corruption, um, literally everything. We would cover disruptive technology, cryptocurrency, um, and I loved my job so much. I started in 2014. And I became an editor in 2015, and <laughs> I didn't think I was going to cry this much. Jeez Louise, not in my practice sessions, but all right, I'm going to keep going. Uh, I knew I was going to cry, but here we go. Oh, waterworks. Um, so yeah, it was, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, it was a challenge as people, you know, when we're involved in this, when we're entrenched in all these stories, it's heavy. It can be a struggle, but even in all my gratitude meditations that I do, having anti-media and being able to work with this organization was always something I was so grateful for. However, as some of you know, last year, we talked about it a little bit yesterday, um, the purge happened whoa, uh, on October 12th. And on October 12th, it was a Thursday in the morning, our founder, Nick Burnaby, got this top notice from Facebook saying our page of over 2 million followers had been unpublished. Um, and then a little bit later in the day, this notice, this is my favorite notice ever. Like I didn't think I would like anything about being banned, but I got this notice from Twitter and it says, you've been suspended for violating the Twitter rules specifically for nothing. There is no answer there. And when I appealed and they denied it, the answer was even more ridiculous. I didn't uh, include that screenshot. Um, safe to say, obviously anti-media was also banned from Twitter. It wasn't just me, our creative executive was banned, our Twitter operator was banned. She got her page back when the LA Times did a story on it, but we did not. So we're still banned. Um, and how did that make me feel? I have to get into this because it's a key part of what I want to talk about today. So I listed them so I didn't forget, as if I would forget how I feel, but felt powerless, silenced, demoralized, disheartened, hopeless, insignificant, frustrated. This is what I've been going through the last year. And on top of that, I've been experiencing what the Buddhists call the second arrow. So I'm already struggling. I already have these emotions that are difficult to deal with. And on top of that, I'm like, oh my God, Carrie, why are you being like this? Like, you should be stronger. You should fight back harder. This is, should be inspiration to, you know, not let up. But that's not how I feel. So <laughs> I have been struggling with it. And I want to be open about that. I haven't really talked about it outside of like, man, this sucks. But it has had a big effect on me. However, this is what I want to get to. I'm just going to read it because I don't want to you know, cry and lose my train of thought. <laughs> These emotions are all pretty much exactly what I would expect someone in my situation to feel. This is a normal reaction. But what if the intensity of my reactivity around being banned was particularly raw and delicate because the entire experience triggered much deeper wiring in me, which I like to call conditioning, just the way we've been conditioned in our lives that have nothing to do with the state. It could have to do with the state, but that's not what I'm talking about. So it was almost like deja vu. So I have had other experiences in my life. I'm not going to get too far into them. I've talked about them briefly in other speeches and other videos, but I am a child of divorce like many people. Uh, it was a particularly turbulent one. I got caught in the middle at the same time, like three of my grandparents died, my dog died, like it was a rough time. But what did that experience leave me feeling? Powerless, silenced, demoralized, disheartened, hopeless, insignificant, frustrated, and embarrassed by these reactions. And I would guess I can't speak for anyone, but I would guess that when any one of us encounters something in our lives that's triggering, that hurts, that causes immense suffering, it's not the first time we felt it. It's probably a very familiar feeling, even if we're not tapped into where exactly it came from. And I also want to say, I'm not special. I am not the only person who's ever felt this way. Maybe other people have not had my exact experience, but the feelings I've been feeling are common among humanity. I'm not alone. And it's also the case that me struggling with anti-media before really trying to go inward and think about what else was underneath, there's an unconscious, or many are unconscious of the root of the pain and they're reacting only to the tip of the iceberg. And what is the consequence of that? First, I wanna talk about the consequences with statism. So if you look at the political realm, especially in America, really anywhere, there's so much blame and anger and reactivity and contempt and that makes it really easy for people to dehumanize their fellow humans. When they're caught in their own trap and they're so consumed with their own suffering, how could they possibly look out at others who disagree with them or who seem like a threat and not dehumanize them and not disconnect? This is a picture of a rally or a protest in Washington, D.C. that Ford Fisher of News to Share documented. Um, the video is actually quite disturbing. It's just 
an anti-Trump protester with a Trump supporter, and they are just going at each other. And you can really feel the hatred. There's so much reactivity. Like, you can see it in their faces. If you watch the video, oh my gosh, it's on his channel. Um, I try not to watch those things, but it's like I couldn't look away. I was like, this is where we are. And I know not everyone is this extreme, but it's really bubbling up. And this brings me to a quote from one of my favorite meditation teachers. She's a former therapist. Uh, she's a Buddhist. And I'm just going to get into it. It's called Unreal Othering. So Tara Brock says, in moments that we find ourselves stuck in reactivity or in some conflict or division, we create what I call an unreal other. Rather than a living, feeling being with wants, needs, and fears, another person has become an idea in our mind and is not subjectively alive or real to us. They are two-dimensional and flat. The more stressed we get, the less real they become. We are the protagonist of our own story, and the other is like a puppet or a pawn. We begin to see them as something that can help us, hurt us, or is simply irrelevant. And I think that in the political world, it's those last two especially. We see these enemies because of the political system, because of the nature of democracy and majority rule. We see these people who don't agree with us as threats or as they don't matter. The way some people look at refugees and immigrants, the way other people look at Trump supporters, they've managed to completely disconnect from their humanity. And this really fuels the political system and is a great tool for politicians and the people in the ruling class. And I want to discuss just briefly the lure of why statism is so powerful with this interplay of our internal emotions that maybe we're not conscious of, but definitely drive our behavior. And it's, I think, especially powerful with democracies and republics because statism, especially democracies and republics, seem to meet all the needs so many of us didn't have met when we were young. And I want to use elections as an example. So when someone votes and they really believe in the system, they feel heard. They feel like they have agency. They feel like they matter. They feel like someone cares about them, even if we can sit here and be like, oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> but that's the propaganda. That's what people are led to believe. And when you go and you punch that little box, or whatever, I don't vote, I haven't voted in a while, but like whether you tap the screen or you punch the, what's the ballot? The ballot, yeah. You feel like you got something out of it. And it might feel like you're temporarily satisfied. I'm heard, I use my voice, I voted, right? Like there's this gratification and feeling of actualization almost. But eventually that goes away, and then another election comes around, and now we have to vote again. We have to be heard again. Use your voice. Be heard. And I think that this is a lot of the reason, this underlying suffering, that people get so corralled into statism, because it's promising them all these things their inner children need, and they may not even know they need. Before I go any further, I just want to get into the shared humanity of all of this. Um, the right-wing keyboard warrior. So I get a lot of comments, or I see a lot of comments, Let's just turn the Middle East into a parking lot. <sighs> okay, well, there's some anger there. I think it's a little more likely that the person typing in all caps on the internet really upset at these strangers they don't know in another part of the world probably has some underlying anger issues that have nothing to do with those people. And they're acting out, and they're triggered, and they're reactive. But it feels way better to be mad at those other people than to go inward. It's not a conscious decision. They're like, oh, I, th I don't want to feel my feelings. I'm going to be mad at that brown person. No, it's not that. It's just that's the default. Another one, the tantrum throwing pussy hatter. We've seen the videos of the people with their pink little hats and they're screaming in the streets and they're hysterical. They're blaming Donald Trump for all their problems. Again, chances are there might be some trauma there that has absolutely nothing to do with Donald Trump. I think that to have that kind of a reaction to something external, you're dealing with something internally. And now I have one that may not go over well, but I gotta talk about it. So the power tripping cop. I'm not talking about the sociopaths who are like, I wanna kill people, I'm gonna be a cop. because. Yes, they exist, and perhaps some of us here would believe that's all of them simply by making that decision. However, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say maybe there are a few cops who don't just wanna kill, but maybe they are attracted to control or authority. They may not necessarily wanna hurt other people, but if you look at those cops, the ones who are just you know, getting joy out of writing tickets and ruining people's days, I would guess they probably had some childhood trauma too. And me, then there's me. Um, I'm not a statist, but if you watch my older videos, holy crap, I'm so reactive, I'm so mean, I'm so angry. And again, yes, I understand, there's a lot of really effed up stuff going on in the world, but years later when I looked back on it, I realized like, oh my gosh, this, this distortion of truth, that's a trigger for me, that's part of my conditioning. This feeling alone in the world and like nobody cares, oh wow, another thing that happened in my childhood, oh my gosh, I can't believe it, how coincidental. Why was I so angry? Why was I so triggered? 
And I'm just gonna read from this one because clearly it's long. Um, hurt people hurt people. Emotional suffering and unconsciousness is bad enough, but projected into the political world, it escalates not only to people being awful to each other, but also to widespread violence and death. As the saying goes, hurt people hurt people, and what I see in politics are a bunch of inner children running around with no presence and no awareness. It is a shitstorm of millions of people's unregulated and unprocessed emotions filtered through politics, which gives false refuge and the illusion of having their needs met by an external source even as people continue to suffer internally. We're grasping, but not we, we're anarchists, but a lot of people are grasping, they just want a fix. They just want the pain to go away. They don't wanna be afraid, they don't wanna be struggling. And then you have this big daddy government that comes in and says, I will protect you, I will save you. Whatever flavor of statism you have, that's what government does. But what about the anarchist community? Because I asked earlier, whether you're an anarchist, whether you're a statist, have you ever felt frustrated? We may not be using the guns of government to force people into submission, but there are a lot of people suffering in this community too because we're human, because humans suffer. It is human to feel pain and to suffer. I don't think, I've talked about this with a lot of people in the community and I don't think anyone has disagreed with me. Like, yeah, some of us are sad. A lot of us are struggling. I am one of them. It's an ongoing process. But no matter how free our minds may be, if our hearts are locked up in this programming, we can understand that government is violence and violence is immoral. Yeah, cool, great. But if we're still acting from unconscious behaviors and unhealed wounds, I don't think we're ever gonna really be free. One, because we're not free internally, but two, because we're gonna have trouble relating to each other and connecting with each other as well as ourselves. And I don't see that going well in an anarchist society. So um, how do you heal though? So before I get into this, I just wanna say that over the last few years, I've noticed a big uptick both in mainstream society and in the anarchist community of people who really wanna heal. They don't wanna be stuck. They want to help themselves. They're looking for solutions, and I love that, and I really commend that. Whatever the modality, that's so beautiful and it's so lovely to see. Um, that's my disclaimer. So, this is me doing yoga. So, um, let's see, this was 2013, and it was a really rough time in my life. I was already an anarchist, but I was still struggling, because, oh my gosh, just changing your philosophy doesn't undo all of your trauma. So I started doing yoga, and I went to my first, I had gone to a couple classes, didn't really connect with it, the third class I went to, I walked out feeling like, oh my gosh, I finally have some peace. I don't remember the last time I had peace. And I actually, for the first time since I was like nine years old, I felt like myself. It was like I had like removed some barriers and I was finally connected with myself. So I'm like, ha, this is it. Yoga's my thing. Yoga's gonna fix me. I'm gonna go do it five times a week and it's gonna make me happy and I'm never gonna have to worry about any of that again. Uh, well. I became a yoga teacher, I got certified, like I still do yoga, so I'm not trying to knock yoga, but after a while, all of a sudden, those old familiar feelings started creeping back in. Didn't matter how much yoga I did, didn't matter how much kundalini I did, still wasn't going anywhere, it was still stuck in me. So then I found meditation, which one of my yoga teacher trainers recommended. Started meditating daily, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is it, huh, I'm finally at peace, yeah, cool, I'm gonna be happy now, all I have to do is meditate. But then, of course, some life situation happened and there I went spiraling again. And I did this with many different things. So then it was acupuncture, it was energy healing, it was uh, sweat lodge ceremonies, which are awesome. And I love all of these things, I really do. I still do them, yoga is a part of my life, I meditate daily. Um, I'm not here to say that these don't add value to people's lives. Yoga and meditation especially are like shown in studies to help ease the symptoms and the suffering of anxiety and depression. But why didn't they fix me? Because as much as I love them, and I really, really, really do, I wouldn't, I, my life would be missing if I stopped doing these things, or my thing, something would be missing from my life. But as much as I love them, I was unconsciously and definitely with good intentions just trying to escape my feelings. I was trying to run away from my pain. Rather than exploring and sitting with my trauma and suffering, which I had absolutely no idea how to do, like, why would I, of course, um, I was using these things to try to just get away. And that's an example of what's called spiritual bypassing. I didn't put a definition of this speech, but it's basically using spiritual methods and tactics unintentionally to run away from what's going on inside rather than turn toward it. Um, and that eventually leads to these issues just crying out louder to be heard, which is exactly what happened to me. And I just wanna point out, uh, obviously yoga and meditation, all of these things, energy work, acupuncture, sweat lodges, they're obviously far more beneficial than they are detrimental. Like, I recommend all of them, they're awesome. But the mechanism of escape that we really need to be present to, in my opinion, is very similar to people who were addicted to anything, to drugs, to social media, to sex. It's, I can't be here right now, I need something else. I need a fix, I need something to fill me up, I gotta go away. And that is so familiar to me, so I'm not 
talking about people I don't know. I'm talking about me. So I just want to be very clear about that. And so to summarize, all of my deeper issues kept bubbling up and spilling over, and being an anarchist couldn't stop it. So what actually helped? So this is what's helped me. I'm just going to go into them very briefly. Um, and I, I don't want to spend too much time on them because they're awesome to explore yourself. But my first thing is Mindful Self-Compassion. And this is an amazing book. It's called the Mindful Self-Compassion Workbook. Uh, you can like write in it. There's exercises. It's like 15 bucks on Amazon. It's by Kristen Neff. She's a psychologist as well as a meditation teacher. And the three components are one, this seems so basic, but it's actually not common and we're not, how, we're not taught how to do it. How am I feeling? Like, let me just check in with myself. What emotions am I actually feeling right now? In the workbook, it's like an end of day thing. So it's like, what did I feel today? So I'm gonna go back to my anti-media example. So I feel really hopeless and I feel powerless and I feel silenced, etc. Part two, which I think is really sweet, is checking in with the shared humanity of it. If I feel this way, I mentioned this earlier, other people in the world feel that way too. And for me, that really made me feel less alone because I think so much of our suffering when we are struggling with these things is feeling like we are the only ones. But at the end of the day, the person sitting next to you has probably felt the same emotion as you at some point. Maybe you're feeling the same thing right now. You don't know. But bringing in that shared humanity helps us reconnect rather than doing that unreal othering thing. And then the third element of mindful self-compassion is talking to yourself like you would a friend. So my internal dialogue, and I've talked to so many people who agree, is kind of mean, right? Like, get it together, get over it, suck it up, be a champ, get it done. But I would never talk to my best friend that way if she were struggling. Um, if you do, I gently maybe suggest that like, you find a different way to communicate if your friend is like bawling their eyes out and you're like, nah, get over it. You know, I don't know. That's my opinion, but doing that to yourself is not something we're taught. We're taught to be nice to our friends. We're not taught to be nice to ourselves. And there's so many narratives out there telling us that we're not enough. So of course we're gonna believe that. So it's really shifting the wiring into a kinder attitude towards ourselves. So that's been incredibly helpful for me. The second takes it a little bit further. Some of you may have heard of this. It is called RAIN. It's an acronym. It is a Buddhist practice. And I have learned about it almost exclusively through Tara Brock. I highly recommend her. She's not an anarchist, but oh my gosh, she's so wonderful. And her heart is just so open and full and she has such amazing wisdom. But it stands for recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture. So recognize is very similar to the self-compassion work. So what am I feeling? Just what's here? Allow sounds really easy, but it can actually be quite difficult because again, we're so conditioned to run from the discomfort. We're human. Why would we want to feel pain? Why would we want to stay with something that's unpleasant? Of course we're gonna run, but the allowing just, okay, I feel disheartened right now, that's what's here. Tara Brock calls it kind of radical acceptance, just accept what is. You can't change it in this moment, so the best you can do is allow it to be there. And in doing so, you create a little bit of space so you're not like lost in this tumultuous storm of emotion, which believe me, I've been there all the time. But when I do this practice, it allows me to take a step back. The next one is investigate, which sounds like really serious, but it's kind of fun. So it becomes, where do I feel this in my body? I almost always feel it in my heart, but you could feel it in your solar plexus, you could feel it in your throat. But it's not just locating it. So the next question that is really key is what am I believing about myself when I'm feeling these feelings? So for me, when I feel lost and disheartened and powerless, underneath that, I'll be totally real, it's I'm not enough. I'm not good enough. Why can't I be better? Why can't I overcome this? And that's a really core belief for me. And that's a tough one to be with. It's like, ugh. My entire self is not enough, oh crap, well that's a lot to deal with. And it's not just the state that causes that. And in that investigation, you then learn, well, how can I be with this? How can I be with this feeling that's so difficult? What does it need? And often for me, this comes back to inner child stuff, which I'm a huge proponent of and I love, but in that moment, I'm needing, first of all, I need to know it's okay that I feel this way. Not everything's okay, it's fine, because that can be kind of dismissive as somebody who's really struggling, but you're allowed to feel this. Of course you feel this way. You're struggling with some really tough stuff. But it's not just that. It could be, I just need to know, and I'm talking to myself here, it's kind of meta. You know, I'm talking to my inner children and like my, my heart, but like, what else could I offer? You just need me to be with you. You need to know that you're enough as you are. And sometimes it's tough to even believe myself when I'm like trying to give myself the support. But even just putting my hand on my heart is an act of love. It's an act of being there for myself. Um, so once you figure that out, you nurture it and you sit with it. And I have found, I've done this practice probably like 150 times in the last year, because I'm just like, oh, I'm feeling it again. Oh no, I gotta get into it, fine. Avoid it as much as I can, and then sometimes you just gotta go with it. Um, every time I do this practice, it gives me release, and it gives me peace, and I'm so grateful for it. And then I just have one more, 
And these kind of factor, or this is sort of an amalgamation uh, that deals more with the inner child of self-compassion and RAIN. So I'm just gonna read this. We are stepping in to give ourselves what we desperately needed as children and need now in a practice of reparenting that seeks not to fix us or get rid of how we feel, but rather to learn to be with the unavoidable pain that comes with being a human being and in doing so, not only release and heal some of these feelings, but also deepen our connection with our true self. I just wanna note, this doesn't mean that the people who have hurt us in our life are bad. Like, I love my mom and dad. They made some mistakes, you know? And the biggest part of the self-compassion practice for me has then been extending it to them. It's like, oh, wait, they're human too. And maybe they were suffering, and maybe they were unconscious of things. That doesn't make them bad, but there is room for both. I can understand that my parents were struggling without condoning some of the mistakes they made and still allowing my hurt to be there. Back to politics. We're almost done. So just as we can hold space for the ways our personal trauma affected us and the suffering of those who inflicted it, we can see the innocent and exploited humanity of those who participate in a corrupt and violent system. And it's not only because they were propagandized into it, but also because the parts of them striving to be heard by government are innocent. And again, it doesn't mean we have to be like, oh, okay, then tread on me, you know, go right on, you're suffering, so by all means. No, it's not that. We can fight back against it, we can challenge it. We can refuse to submit, but we can also not allow ourselves to become numb and disconnected from our fellow humans. We can see that they're suffering too. So I just wanna share a quote. This is sort of an occult-themed conference, which I didn't touch on much at all. Um, but I have a quote from someone who talks about it a bit. Her name's Laura Matsu. She's a meditation teacher. Highly recommend following her. She's awesome. It's a little long, but here we go. Before you look for your guru, before you try ayahuasca, before you go into the occult, before you go into the astral realms to try to find the demonic being who is draining your life force, start with the basic psychological issues. Work on your issues with your parents. If you are in an abusive relationship, it's most likely you grew up in a home where abuse occurred and there's some part of you that needs to be healed so that abuse no longer feels like home. If you find yourself being attracted to emotionally unavailable people, find the trauma in your childhood that created the core belief that you are not worthy of love. We often want to jump to far off places when really the entry point of the patterns in our lives is to be found in the places in our early childhood that we have not addressed yet. Start from the ground up. And I just love that. And I just want to say, this is going to be a lifelong practice for me. It's not like I do rain three times and I sit with my, my inner child a couple times and I'm like, oh, done, fixed, cool, I never have to worry. No, these are deeply steeped beliefs. And I kind of find myself doing that with statism as well. It's like I still have these status tendencies and then I check in and it's like, no, Carrie, think rationally. No, okay, we're good, got it. But it is an ongoing thing and it does take commitment. So I'm just gonna read, these are my last two little points, but I don't wanna mess them up. So yes, government causes trauma and suffering and I do not wanna discount that. But even if we become anarchists, we can't keep up our conditioned beliefs and habits and reactivity if we really want to establish and maintain a free society. If we're caught up in our unconscious impulses and conditioning, the worst elements of statism will crop right back up. And just like freedom, true conscious awareness and commitment to individual healing require personal responsibility and taking care of yourself free of dependence on other external sources. And in my humble opinion, we need both to ever be truly free. That's it. Thank you. Thank you guys for letting me cry. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Carrie Weather. <laughs>